Welcome to Concussion Talk Podcast. I'm Nick Mercer. This is episode 132, I believe. And I've been on podcast since like six weeks. So, you know, so good luck to me and to Jenna and Lauren who are joining me. And I will actually, Lauren will, Lauren will do Jenna and Jenna will, we go with Shaw and no, Lauren might not listen to my podcast. If you haven't, then go back and listen to hers, Lauren Zach's <laughs> and uh, Jenna Tucker. I don't want to be, you know, you don't want to, you know, say one thing and I'm good with it. Anyway, um, so this is going to be about just on me. But first, I guess I would like to thank my sponsor, Head to Health. And this is the first video podcast I've done. So I don't have the the recording that I sit, I put in for, for the, the ad for Head Check. So I'm trying to remember it off of my head. It's Head to Health bridges the gaps in concussion care through simple, powerful technology. Organizations, organizations like the Canadian Football League, Track Factory Racing, the Canadian Junior Hockey League, Eastern Washington University, and Volleyball Canada rely on Hedgick to improve communication and optimize care. Visit hedgehealth.com for more. And then I start talking again. So that's and we so now now to Lauren Zayas and Janet Tucker, both videos and very talk with Disonia and uh they're Reason to, uh, I should read out in the article they are presenting in November at the ACRM, which is the American Congress for Rehabilitative Medicine. <laughs> uh, um, and, and I just lost your Lawrence, and I don't. It's called emerging something, but that was the stupid thing. But I get it. Emerging trends in dysautonomia or something. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Emerging trends in management of dysautonomia. Emerging strategies to identify and manage dysautonomia after brain injury. A team approach. That's your. That's oh, for That's the reason. I, I don't know if you're. I don't know which. I don't know. I don't know what your article is. I'll take your word for it. Yeah, you know, so it's too many, many articles, things to keep. So many presentations. We can't keep track anymore. <laughs> well. <laughs> It did, well, that does, that's not to sound obnoxious. It's just yeah. the truth. We just can't keep track of the title. <laughs> I'll give it. I'll give it to Lauren and Jenna to get going on this because Lauren wrote something that Jenna and I decided we cannot understand at all, which wrote on some <laughs> iPad or we're like, what is she saying? She's like, I thought we'd discuss this. And it's like a bunch of smarts right now. Like, okay, sure. Let's just cut that. And then, what, Jenna? I mean, Jeff, Lauren, good. I wish I could say uh, my handwriting's like that because my brain injury. But I think it's a mixture of being left-handed and a requirement to get oh, into left, school for medicine left, of some sort. Left-handed. Right? <laughs> my my dad was left-handed, and uh, he is a uh, his handwriting was uh, tough to understand too. All right, so welcome back. Uh, I'm so excited to be back. It's been a long time since we did a Phoenix Concussion Recovery Concussion Talk podcast. Um, I have since had a baby and been on maternity leave, so I apologize for my absence. Um, I have my good friend Jenna Tucker here from Kane University. She's a clinical assistant professor, um, and she also directs their neurological programming for their school. So um, Jenna, thanks so much for partnering with me in all of our research and presentations, and now being suckered into coming on a podcast yeah. with video uh for the first time it's <laughs> <laughs> not a surprise thank you both for having me i'm excited so today we want to talk about um, some of this emerging research coming out for dysautonomia. So we've got a presentation coming up in November at the American College of Rehab Medicine's big annual um conference, which is really exciting. That's a really big rehabilitative medicine conference. And we actually are also going to be at CSM this year for physical therapists specifically in February. Um, and then we've got two articles. One was published in January, February. Jenna's the detail names and dates. I didn't do great Mar history class. March is um, your identification. In, in March. Okay. Identify. <laughs> uh, yeah, I March. can read the title. Uh, the identifying trends and signs okay. and symptoms associated with dysautonomia during the Buffalo concussion treadmill test, a retrospective study. And that's actually what we're going to talk mostly about today. Okay. Um, and then we just got word this morning that we had another one that will be heading into the proofing stage. So we'll talk a little bit about that test retest manuscript as well. Yeah. So, um, Jenna, when we talk about dysautonomia, obviously this has been around forever. Um, POTS was called mm -hmm. so, uh, soldier's heart during the civil war, but this 
new understanding with concussion is emerging pretty rapidly. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of like that per tab systematic review and like kind of how we've moved from exercise intolerance to dysautonomia as the term that we're using now post concussion? So specifically post concussion. So um, per tabs article came out the one the 2018 one you're talking about, right? Mm hmm. Um, yeah, and he started to just kind of identify this connection between changes in cerebral blood flow um, and changes in kind of the autonomic system that result in a dysregulation of your autonomic nervous system and um, how there is a correlation that um, after concussion, when you have all these metabolic changes and this neurometabolic cascade, that um, this can kind of occur. So in 2020, I'm not so great with dates, um, the... Um, clinical practice guideline for concussion management came out and they identified um, exertional, I think they called it exertional tolerance. I forgot the exact term because there's so many terms now, but um, essentially autonomic dysfunction after concussion as one of these kind of um, subclassifications of things that need to be treated, which was great because um, way back when, I think in 2014, Collins and his colleagues had identified um, six what they called clinical uh, trajectories wow. after concussion and um, dysautonomia or exertional intolerance was not part of that. So it was great to see in the clinical practice guidelines that it was included. And um, now that it was included, they did make um, substantial recommendations that, and I believe they reported level two evidence that PTs specifically should be utilizing graded exertional assessments to evaluate exercise intolerance um, when it's suspected after concussion. Um, that's kind so of wait, I'm concussion. just going to interrupt you real quick. Yeah. So for patient-friendly language, because that's the majority of the listeners to this podcast, what she's saying is our national guidelines came out and they identified this subset as its own entity. So you have like your neck, your eyes and your inner ears. And now instead of saying just exercise intolerance, they said autonomic or your fight or flight system, that rest and digest system that you have in your body can become abnormal after a concussion. And we've done podcasts about dysautonomia and POTS in the past. So you can go over to concussiontalk.com and look up more about those topics in general. Um, they're quite fascinating. So um, circling back to what Jenna was saying, basically our national organization said, we need to be looking at this. There's fairly strong evidence, but there's a lot of work to be done to figure out exactly what to be doing and how exactly to treat it. That's what level two evidence evidence means. And um, that means that the onus is on us as healthcare providers to start educating ourselves and doing a better job of identifying these people and then also treating them. Sorry, Jenna. I think no, I, I think forgot to tell you the I'm, primary I'm, audience. I, yeah, I was like, oh, I just realized I don't know who our audience is exactly. But um, but yeah, so thank you, Lauren, for breaking that down. But I think what, you know, what she was touching on is a huge piece in that clinicians, specific physical therapists, were not really given the tools to handle situations when patients presented with these kind of bizarre symptoms, a lot of which overlap with concussion symptoms. So sometimes people have these long-term symptoms, um, you know, changes in digestion and, um, you know, significant fatigue, things that they kind of wrote off and were like, I guess I'm just living with this. And um, so now it's great because physical therapists have a tool to actually evaluate this appropriately and to help people recover from some of these symptoms. I think we lost more. And then just to recap some of those. <laughs> oh, was that my, is that mine that's glitchy or is it yours? <laughs> you <froze laughs> Sorry. <for a> moment. <laughs> you know, I'm out in the woods. I'm doing my best. Um, <laughs> so what's really interesting about the symptoms of exercise intolerance, which we're now calling dysautonomia, is that exercise intolerance is only one piece. So maybe you had a head injury or maybe you have long COVID and now you can't exercise the way that you used to be able to. Or you walk up a flight of stairs and you feel like your heart is racing out of your chest or you feel really short in a breath. But then there's also these sort of weird zebra type symptoms that once you know what you're looking for as a clinician, these people scream at you when they walk through the door. And again, you can go back and listen to our other podcasts, but Hold some on. of those, if you're listening, you're like, but I want to know now, what do I need to know? What are zebra type symptoms? Zebra type symptoms. Okay. So um, things like changes in your sweating patterns. Maybe your sweat now is smellier than it used to be, or maybe it's more profuse or it's 
absent. You don't sweat at all. Maybe you have um, night sweats. Maybe you have digestive problems. Maybe you have headaches. Maybe you have a weird lightheadedness with standing. I can't stand and cook in the kitchen anymore because I feel lightheaded. I can't stand and braid my hair. I have to sit down in order to do those things. Um, standing and folding my laundry is really hard. Maybe you have dizziness with positional changes. And so people are treating you for vertigo, but you're not getting better, right? So there's a lot of these really interesting symptoms that can happen. Oh, and why do they call it zebra type? Oh, why do they call it zebra? Um, just meaning they're not normal symptoms, quote unquote normal, right? So after a concussion, the it's typical to have dizziness in the car, or it's typical to have headaches with reading, right? It's difficult yeah. to have sleep issues. Those would be like sort of your horse, so like your normal oh, symptoms. Yeah. Like that's, those are the symptoms you're... people are familiar with. Like the, I feel like in general, most of the public would say, oh, concussion. Oh yeah, you get dizzy or, oh, you get headaches. Like those things make sense to people. But some of these other symptoms that Lauren's talking about don't necessarily, um, people don't make that connection that it could right. be from the concussion. Right. Or um, from some other cause of the dysautonomia. Like a zebra turkey. Yeah. Is she frozen for you too, Nick? It, yeah, she is. But she's uh, she is frozen now. So we'll just talk um, what she's saying. She's saying the zebra type symptoms. Um, yeah. So in the study that we yeah. ran, um, we just that was published back in March, um, the the symptoms that were most common that we were finding associated with this dysautonomia were hot flashes or temperature intolerance. Like Lauren was saying, you either all of a sudden were much colder all the time than usual or much hotter. Um, digestive changes were a very big one that people often wouldn't connect to a concussion. Um, weight loss or weight gain that was, um, oh, she's back. And then um, abnormal fatigue, like Lauren's saying, when we say abnormal fatigue, meaning you get up to make yourself, um, you know, some breakfast and halfway through scrambling an egg, you have to sit down. You can't even stand up to do those right. things. So that's the kind of fatigue we're talking about. Right. Now, Lauren, can you She's back. be back or are you just, your audio's off? I don't know what's don't know. happening with my, uh, my the hotspot is being a little funny. Sorry. Hotspot, it's just, it's not. Not, not really. Get rolling with the punches. That's exactly. how we work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And next thing, next time I'm gonna try to understand your writing. So it'll be fun. <laughs> Sorry, I'm on. I'm on a hot spot. I'm out in Glenwood Springs, Colorado today. So uh, we're we're doing our best here. <laughs> um. So okay, that's great. So we got a nice nice little circle back to what dysautonomia is and sort of that history of where we've come from. Um, what's really important is there is a lot of good evidence out there for the Buffalo concussion treadmill test. And we've talked a little bit about this in the past. That comes from Letty's research group um, out of Buffalo, New York. And it's essentially a cardiology test that was modified for concussion. And it's been validated over and over again in the research. But previously, it was being used for um, signs of exercise intolerance and how to prescribe exercise to get back to your normal life, primarily in the sports a concussion population. So you have a teenager, they get hit in the head with a baseball, they have a concussion, and you use this test to help modulate their exercise back. So because this test was already really robust in the research, and there's this emerging signs of dysautonomia being a part of concussion, we decided to use what was already there in the research and just zhuzh it up a bit and modify it so that it could work for this more tailored approach. And so we are so appreciative of all the work that's come before us. And our job is just to build off of that and continue to validate it in this subset population. So that brings us to our article um, that we had published in March, which is ultimately going to be what we'll be um, presenting on at the next two conferences that we'll be doing this year as we wait for the next stuff to come out in publication. So Jenna, do you want to take on at all what some of these signs and symptoms were on the Buffalo concussion treadmill test, the things that we were looking for that were different than what the traditional research says to be looking for as cutoffs? Yeah. So um, in addition to the traditional um, signs and symptoms, so I think there are how many, how many um, qualification or um, criteria for cutoff for the original Buffalo, maybe like 10 or so. So um, it was um, if you had a symptom increase of more than three points, if you had a no, rapid that was for hours, and then for the no for the the buffalo the traditional protocol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then okay. we just added more symptoms. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, okay. 
So, um, so what we did was in addition, so we obviously anybody who could not complete the Buffalo protocol per the original protocol was, um, you know, included, but we also looked at, I'm just pulling up here to make sure I got this all. Um, so is it increase this, you're sure about this, Lauren, an increase of three or more points on the VAS scale? Um, yes. Okay. So if you had symptoms, so what that means is that at rest, if you, on a scale of zero to 10, you would be asked to rate the severity of your symptoms. Many people have experiences with pain, but it can be done with any symptom. So let's say you had fatigue um, or dizziness. You would be asked at rest on a scale of zero to 10, how bad is your dizziness right now? And let's say you set a three. Then you get on, you do the treadmill test. And if your symptom level exceeded three or more points above that, so six or more, that would be a criteria um, to stop the test. Another would be an, what we call an RPE, rate of perceived exertion. Um, so that's, again, that's a scale that we use to have you rate how much exertion you feel like you're giving. So more than six, uh, 17, right, Lauren, 17, um, then you the test was terminated. Um, another one was if the clinician who was administering the test, so the PT that was supervising the test, decided that there was a significant risk involved for the patient, some kind of health or safety risk, they would stop the test. Um, if the patient reached 90% of their or more of their age expected maximum heart rate um, and still reporting a low rate of perceived exertion, meaning you're on the test, you're doing the test and you're like, I feel okay. I don't feel great, but their heart rate was just skyrocketing, um, was another one. And then if they request to stop the test. So, um, in addition, what we also found for the patients that were involved in this study, which I don't know if you were going to get into this, Lauren, but are outside of that traditional, um, youth sports population, right? So the majority of the Buffalo concussion treadmill test research that has been done to this point um, is usually on young athletes. So in our study, we had um, we had I forget the average age, but the age was um, a, oh, I think I have it here. Let's see, um, maybe I don't. But the average age was much higher, and the majority of our population was not due to a sports related injury. Um, so when they were doing the test, some of the things that we were finding um, really. Oops, She's coming in and out again. Oh, yes. She knows what you're saying. What's that? She knows what you're saying. Oh, there you are. All right. Thanks, sorry. <laughs> um, I just went, I switched my phone so I don't have to keep messing around. Sorry, everyone who's listening. <laughs> That's okay. Um, um, you were asking me what what I what I wanted to mention there. The age. The age. I don't remember where I don't know where you got cut you're, off. You're talking oh, about the okay. ages. So, so when I last heard was Jenna was going through um, some of the typical reasons that we would cut off. Yep. And then what was really fascinating in the clinic that we were finding was, so in, in the protocol, it says that you can use what's called a pulse oximeter, which is a finger monitor. Yep. And those have been validated to be effective. They aren't as good as a chest strap, which is what we now use. We use a chest strap monitor bipolar. Um, I don't get anything for recommending them. They just are the best. And then um, we... We're also using the RPE chart, which is just a colored chart that you tell what level of effort that you're working out at. And what we thought was really interesting was we were finding that the heart rate was dropping on the pulse oximeter. And we were kind of like, what's going on there? Um, so that then we would switch also out. measures your, your oxygen content of the blood, right? So yeah, so, yeah, measures your oxygen content and your heart rate. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So, oh, okay. So we were seeing clinically that these numbers weren't making any sense or their oxygen was dropping to like, 65 percent the person's talking to you walking on a treadmill so there's no way that your oxygen level is 65 percent right so then we were switching out constantly which pulse oximeter to use and we were trying to double check so we started to realize that there was something going on with their peripheral blood flow and that will need to be validated in in much more specific studies later on but it, to us it was a warning sign that there was something happening because the patients who weren't having an atypical test were not having this issue with their pulse oximeter the patients who were having sweating responses or anxiety when they would do the test or a lot of autonomic symptoms outside of just headache and dizziness, maybe their fatigue was going up, maybe they were getting leg cramping, things like that. They were the patients who were having these abnormal peripheral or responses from their finger. 
And so that's some of the data that we, we tracked in this study was, was their heart rate plateauing across multiple stages? So yeah. if your level of effort's going up, your heart rate should go up in a correlation, which has been well validated in the research. But we were finding a patient, the, the incline on the treadmill is going up and up and up, and the heart rate's not changing for three or more stages. That's very abnormal. Um, or they were getting these weird pulses. Um, and that's what we're using to show a sign of this autonomic dysregulation that we're going to use future studies to validate further with better research. Yeah. Yeah. So in the study, um, a good portion of the reason that we had to discontinue the, the test was not due to those traditional reasons I was talking about before when you would normally terminate the test, but it was more so like Laura was saying that their heart rate, instead of steadily increasing at a, you know, a, a fairly normal rate would drop um, or plateau. Other reasons were they were having um, an exacerbation of their baseline concussion symptoms. So at rest, if they were, you know, dizziness was an issue for them, they were having severe dizziness and that was the reason that they were stopping. Or they would have the onset of some of these, what we call autonomic symptoms that we talked about earlier, um, like that change in temperature and um, change in digestion, things like that. And then the, oh, sorry. The, uh, uh, the drop in oxygen saturation um, that Lauren was talking about also. Yeah, so we had 70% um, out of our 57 patients that we included in this study, 70% had an abnormal peripheral response. So an abnormal response on that pulse oximeter. And so like I said, that led our clinic to changing, even though the research said it was okay to use wristwatches or finger monitors to track this test, we realized that we can't use those in this population because they don't perfuse the way they're supposed to to their hands or because something's going on in their nervous system that these tools actually don't work for them. And so that led to a policy change in our clinic where we started to um, use those polar heart rate monitors and those have been validated as well. They're about 95% as effective as a five week EKG. So we started to know that we were getting really good data for any future per exercise prescription or any future research. Yeah. Um, what was interesting on our um, symptom tracking from this study was that we actually had almost 30% of our patients had autonomic symptom presentation and 63% had concussion symptoms. So even though we had some interesting um, drops in their peripheral blood flow, interesting heart rate changes, the symptom scores, um, were, I would have expected them to be higher. I would have thought we would have been well over 50 to 70% on each of those concussion symptoms and autonomic symptoms. So it was interesting to me that you can find an irregular heart rate pattern without the patient necessarily having a significant symptomatic change. And I don't know what that means. I don't know if Jenna has any thoughts about that, but I don't know what that means. And I'm excited to see what it shows in the research in the future. Yeah, I think it's something that we will hopefully incorporate into different studies um, going forward be able to understand yeah. better. Yeah. Um, Jen, was there anything else from this study? Um, th the main thing with this one was introducing the Buffalo concussion treadmill test as a tool to identify dysautonomia and what a clinician could look for. Um, were there any other findings that you thought were interesting? Like, should we go through maybe some of our max heart rate data and that delta difference? Yeah, you wanna maybe touch on the delta difference a little bit? I can try to pull up some of the numbers. Sure. So we introduced in this study, and who knows if this will stay, but our goal is that this is a, a new outcome measure that's used in future research. Um, but we were talking about what we call a heart rate delta. And so we were looking for a measure that we could use that wouldn't necessarily change only because your conditioning level improved. So let's say you weren't, this wasn't a sports-related concussion. We're trying to move outside of only doing research on sports-related concussions and, and reflect the actual population that gets head injuries, right? 50% um, are from falls. And so we were looking at people who maybe are part of the general population. So maybe you don't exercise and play soccer on a league four days a week, right? Maybe you work a desk job and you try to go to the gym a couple times a week or you try to go for walks. And so what is your base level of conditioning and how does that impact what we think is dysautonomia? And so we were looking for a measure that wouldn't be significantly affected by you know, Nick swims all the time. That's part of his rehab. He's, and Jenna's a big time runner. And maybe I am a little less active than them. And maybe I go for walks five days a week. I do more than that now because my pots is better, but mm. just kidding. Um, but, you know, just saying different people are going to present differently. And so this Delta difference is 80% of your age expected max 
minus 80% of your max heart rate you achieved on the test. So typically we would stop the test and you take 80% of whatever that number is as your prescription. So that's also a standardized measure. So we knew that that's a good measure. So we were taking 80% of what your age max should be, 80% of what you achieved on the test. And that difference is we're calling a delta difference. And we don't know how high that number needs to be. We don't know if one number is more important than the other, but we were just starting to track. It's, this is how research works. We're just starting to track how big is that number. And then we'll be able to figure out, is there a clinically significant amount that you would want to start to trigger? Maybe patients who have more than a 25 beat per minute difference, that's going to be somebody who takes longer to recover. But we just don't know yet. Yeah. And uh, we've done some, <clears throat> some look in, we've looked into some other research and there really hasn't been anything else out there on this, this concept. Um, I, we believe we were the first to introduce this idea of using this as a, as a measurement um, when doing the Buffalo concussion treadmill test. So hopefully it's a good jumping off point to build um, further and be able to give more specific criteria and um, you know feedback and prognosis for these patients. Prognosis is key, right? Because a patient always says to me, how long is this going to take? How long and, is it going to take? Yeah. And right now I can say, well, my average patient takes, you know, two to three months, but some people take a little bit longer depending if they have POTS or not, right? So we'll be able to start to say, hopefully the goal is we'll be able to start to say, oh, you were 40 beat per minute difference. Typically patients take X amount of time. Oh, you were a 30 beat per minute difference. X amount of time. Did, were you able to pull up that data? Cause I have it in front of me if you want me to. Um, uh, yeah. What part did you want to go over? Um, I thought our Delta difference was really interesting. Um, and then what the 80, what the average patient's prescription would have been that 80% prescription. Yeah. So our Delta difference, the 80.66 you're talking about mm -hmm. was our, the, <clears throat> so the mean for the individuals in our study for the Delta difference was, um, 80.66. So their 80% um, heart rate max prescription that we used was 111.54. So I guess you wanna kind of explain what that means clinically, Lauren? Yeah, so if you were a healthy individual and you were um, doing this test, oh goodness, that means I'd have to do some math. Hold on a second here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, how you get your 80% of your age expected max is you take 220 beats per minute minus your age. So we'll say an old person like me who's 36 years old, my age expected max is 184 beats per minute, roughly, right? We're not doing VO2 max exertional testing where they fall off the back of the treadmill and people with head injuries. So we're using the calculation, okay? So 184 beats per minute would be my max heart rate. So if I multiply that by 0.8, I should get to 147 beats per minute, okay? That would be a normal test result, pending my conditioning level and things like that. So our average, our mean patient, our average patient had 111 beats per minute as their at max appropriate heart rate. That's a huge difference from where we should be as people. And I'm a little older than our average patient, right? So I'm, I'm skewing the data a little bit, but the gap is actually bigger. That's where you see this 80 beat per minute delta. So our average patient had an 80 beat per minute difference between what their 80% max should be and what their 80% prescription rate was. That's a huge difference. Yeah. So this is not just a little bit of exertional intolerance. This isn't just a little bit of I'm having trouble exercising. This is saying our patients are getting headaches, dizziness, or abnormal heart rate response at 80 beat per minute difference between where they should be. And so that has to mean something. And that's that this is how research works. You start with a retrospective, you find something that looks interesting, that probably means something, and then you dig into it. And then people do big expensive studies that we probably won't be able to do. And they really figure out what it is that we're looking at um, scientifically, what we're seeing clinically. Yeah, to put that in reference, it's just a little math. So the average age for our patient population in this study was uh, 27.8 years. So for that population, their max heart rate would be around 193. So that 80, um, that delta difference of 80, it would bring them down to 100, what, 10, 13, mm -hmm. somewhere in that range, right? Mm -hmm. So you're supposed to be able to get up to about, let's say 193, and they're only getting to 110, 113. That's a really big difference. Yeah. Nick, you think you want to ask a question? Me? Yeah. Oh no! I'm just, I'm just, okay. Just enthralled, but it's in like just our the average like resting heart rate is like seventy two or 
Isn't yeah, it? usually 60 to 100 is considered yeah. normal for average resting heart rate, depending on your age. Like, if it's like 100, then you got like nothing. You can't do anything. Yeah, right. You can't do anything. Yeah. And, and and so that's a great, that's okay. a great point. Sorry, Jenna, but that's what patients say, Nick. Well, that means I can't do anything. Yeah. Right. And then you say, no, no, no. <laughs> That's where we put you into the protocol, right? So then oh, we have an answer for it. I'm so sorry. some of these patients may have to start in what's called the horizontal plane where they're lying on their back. And we talked about this in the POTS pro, um, podcast that we did. But so basically level one of exercise is in the horizontal plane where you're lying on your back and exercising. And then you go to a recumbent bike, which is where you're sitting back in that like sling kind of thing. And then you go to an upright bike and then you go to standing and walking and then you go back to jogging. So what we're using the test results from is to give us a starting point. And then based on that starting point, we're picking what's called a modality or the type of exercise that you're doing so that we're not triggering a lot of symptoms. There's no guesswork involved. It becomes standardized to you. And then we progress you all the way back to normal. So you can resume your normal life without having a lot of regressions or meaning symptom increases where you go backwards. Yeah. And I think the biggest piece there, Lauren said, was um, having it be tailored to each individual patient. That's the key here yeah. is that um, people, you know, if this is not a one size fits all recovery process and people need to understand that I'm sure there are many, many, many people out there who are very frustrated because they've kind of been bounced around and are being put into these generalized programs. And you you really do need a very specific tailored program for each individual to for their specific heart rate that they're achieving right everybody's different so that's the only way you really can effectively i think manage and move forward would you agree that's a that's a big part of what we're working on with our work group with the university of utah so um uh we have a, a work group between intermountain healthcare and university of utah which is um to the big healthcare systems and it's been really great to work together because we may see slightly different patients on that spectrum of dysautonomia. Um, and the goal is to create a flexible, tailorable, but structured, measurable, and progressive exercise program, meaning patients are going to enter that protocol wherever they're supposed to be. And you as a clinician are going to guide it the time that it takes and how they progress through based on that person's presentation. But the structural framework is there so that you know exactly how to move people through. And that is extremely challenging to do. Yeah. flexible but structured measurable but com you know compliant it's it's really challenging but it's important that we do this because that is how you're going to be able to drop a protocol in a pdf and send it out to anybody anywhere and that clinician will be able to help their patients right away and and that's the goal because these people people with dysautonomia we we really do suffer in the beginning we can lead very full normal healthy lives later on but when we are sick like i was for 12 years before i was diagnosed our quality of life is really quite poor. Um, and then it takes a short amount of time with a really good clinician and we're back living our lives, you know, and, and have, going to work and having babies and exercising and, you know, Jenna's running her crazy little marathons or whatever she's doing over there. And so, yes. you know, it, it's, it's great to have an objective measurable solution to such a big and scary problem. You know, it's interesting Lauren. I, I, I learned through analogies. So I feel like a similar kind of situation is uh, people who often live for years and years and years of very bad dizziness. My mother is an example. She had dizziness from a car accident for years and years. And she tried medications and everything. And just like Laura was saying, horrible quality of life, similar to individuals who have dysautonomia symptoms. And then I was in PT school and learned that you can evaluate something called BPPB, which can cause dizziness. And I did it and I knew the treatment and I did the treatment with her and since then, she's been totally fine, right? And I'm not saying it's a same thing where it's a snap of a finger, but if you can find the right clinician who understands the right way to treat it, um, it is manageable. It's just finding that right person who knows um, and is able to help you uh, move forward. I know it Absolutely. Be, it's a very frustrating diagnosis. It's very vague to a lot of people who have it and also to people who treat it. It's still not, um, I feel like, very commonly understood in even in the healthcare world. And Lauren, you did a you did a podcast about BPPV or BPPV, whatever. Oh, BPPV, yeah. And we yeah. did um three PD too. We talked about yeah. um, chronic dizziness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Dizziness. People, 
if, if people are listening and you are dizzy uh, 24-7, most days, uh, every day of the week, throughout the day, and it is not spinning in nature, so weird types of dizziness that are not spinning dizziness, um, and you've been suffering for that for a while, more than three months, go ahead and listen to our 3PD podcast, Persistent Postural Perceptual Dizziness, to help you find somebody near you um, who can help you treat that. Yeah. Good Great. plug, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to bring us to, since we're talking about the positives here, like these people are treatable, right? Let's talk a little bit about um, our new study that we just got word this morning is going into the proofing stages. So here we took um, from that 57 patients of the study in March, we looked at people who had a repeat test, meaning they didn't get all the way better just with instructions on how to progress their exercise. They still had symptoms after more than a month later. And so we decided to retest them to make sure we were making progress or figure out what was going on and how to change them. And so this is a much smaller N or a much smaller sample size. So 57 patients is pretty darn good. 12 patients is great. It's a great place to start, but it's not the most robust study. It's not a hundred patients, right? So again, these are the starting places. Um, this is the infant stage of this type of research. And then our hope is that our retrospective that we're doing on 70 patients will come out pretty soon here. And then we're hoping to have some prospective studies um, where we can really validate some of the things that we're looking at, okay? So of those 12 patients, we were able to look at test retest data. So how did they do even though they weren't 100% better? And Jenna, do you want me to go over any of those or do you want to pull up those stats? Yeah, so um, let's see. So of those patients, oops, so many papers. Um, right, so just to kind of give some background, um, like Lauren said, there were 12 patients. This average age was 24. So again, we're talking about a little bit of an older population than the traditional research that is out there. Their average amount of time from their injury to their um, first Buffalo concussion travel test was about 30 days and their average time from their first Buffalo concussion treadmill test to the, what we call post-intervention or after they'd done a little bit of treatment was about 37 days, right? So um, what happened was in that time frame, from when they took their, they had their first test done to see where they were at their baseline to their post-treatment, their first round of treatment, we'll say, um, they, their, their um, mean average stage, right? We'll talk about stage first. Mm -hmm. Stage achieved um, was 11.83, meaning, sorry, the difference was 2.6. So they were able to achieve the stage on the Buffalo concussion channel test is basically the number of minutes they're able to tolerate it for. Um, so they improved from an average about 9.67 stage or minutes on the first one up to 11.83 on the second one. Mm -hmm. So that heart rate threshold that we talked about, right? Where you want to achieve that certain percentage of your heart rate max on their initial one, they were achieving about 127 beats per minute. But on the second one, they were able to get all the way up to about 149 beats per minute. So there was a, a significant improvement they were able to get to a much higher heart rate without those symptoms coming on and limiting them. So that's definitely something that we, you know, we wanted to make note of. And then the um, mean delta difference. So that's what Lauren had talked about a little bit before, right? In the on their first Buffalo concussion treadmill test, these 12 patients, their average delta was 93.72, meaning they were 93. 0.72 beats per minute mm -hmm. below where they should have been getting to. That's huge. After about a month or so of treatment on their um, test afterwards, their Delta difference was only 36. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a really big difference. That's showing that's an improvement, but what's interesting and what we talked about a bit in the paper, and Lauren can kind of touch on this more since these are her patients. Um, is that these people that were supposedly not getting better, right? They weren't at their baseline. They weren't where they felt like quote unquote normal or that they felt like they could be moving forward and discharged from PT. Even though they weren't feeling that way, 
this data shows they were improving, meaning they still need to keep going because the it, it is effective. It's just they needed a little bit more time. So one of the things we want to look at in the future, and hopefully this is kind of another jumping off point for future research, is what does that more specifically look like, right? Lauren said this is a pretty small-ish sample size. So we're just kind of testing these theories out a little bit now, but in bigger studies in the future, we want to look to see once somebody achieves whatever amount by that retest, how do we change that protocol specifically to tailor it specifically to them again to more effectively move them forward from there? Is that, you want to add on to that at all, Lauren? Yeah, no. And you know what? Now, I haven't looked at the data this way with these two studies side by side. Um, so it's pretty interesting. It, it's fascinating to me. And I don't know if it would be clinically significant, right? Because you have to run the data. But in this subgroup, our 80% um, threshold was 102. And in the other paper, it was 111. And our mean delta is 93. And in the other paper, it was 80. So it would be really interesting to see if there was a difference like, did these people end up needing that retest because they were higher, they were skewing the data one way versus the other, the other, what, 57, 12, so whatever, you know, math's not my strong suit, but the other 45, 45 patients were, uh, I had a brain injury, leave me alone. Um, the other 45 patients were, uh, maybe, maybe they presented differently. I don't know that we have enough, um, we didn't go back I don't know to that the data is robust enough to look at it, but we could always go back. I mean, we could always look at that in future, like try to do a two group analysis and then retest everybody. Um, and that's where prospective trials come in because then there's funding to do that where patients don't have to pay for a test they don't need. But um, it's kind of hard when you're doing, when you're doing unfunded research, just to give you a little bit of a scope of how research works, when you're doing unfunded research, it's really hard to ask someone to come back in and do an unnecessary test just for me to see what's going on. Right. Um, so when you have funding, you're able to uh, mandate certain types of, of testing regimens because the patient's not paying for it. So it would be it would be fascinating, I think, to see what the other people looked like at that same time frame and then subgroup them and compare them against each other. Um, so we need to look at that in a future study for yeah, sure. That's definitely something we've talked about, hopefully looking at um, going forward. Like Warren yeah. said, we need some dollars to do that. <laughs> Anybody want to fund our research? Um, so, <laughs> so it's really exciting. So basically to summarize where we're at, because y'all are probably bored of listening to all these statistics and you're like, what does this mumbo jumbo even mean to me? Basically the research is building really, really fast that there is a correlation between how your fight or flight rest and digest system is monitoring itself. Cause you're not supposed to be thinking about how fast you breathe. You're not supposed to be thinking about how fast your heart is beating or what temperature you are, right? Unless you're in extreme heat or extreme cold, put a jacket on, right? But other than that, on a day-to-day -day basis, you shouldn't be, you're not a lizard living in a tank with a heat lamp. You should be able to regulate your own body temperature, okay? So now we know that patients are presenting with these interesting symptoms that nobody knew what to do with before. Oh, they're really not that interesting. They fit into these little buckets and now we know that's dysautonomia. Okay, well, how do we identify dysautonomia other than asking about a bunch of weird symptoms? Well, now we've got a heart rate-based measurable test that's validating the research to see how your nervous system is regulating itself. How is your brain and your heart talking to one another to adjust your heart rate? Now we've got some test retest data to say, okay, where do we need to go from here? How do we make sure we're measuring what we think we're measuring? And then you have to build a treatment protocol, which we're doing. So don't worry if you're sitting there like, oh, I got to wait 10 years for these people to get it together, right? That's not the case. It's just the research might take 10 years to get all the way out there. Unfortunately, it falls uh, a lot slower than clinical practice. But now we're going to start doing some research to make sure we're measuring what we think we're measuring, make sure that we can create a protocol that other clinicians can use. And then we're going to use that research to test and retest that our protocol is actually working the way it clinically appears to be working, right? Um, the clinic is full because patients are getting better, so more people come. So we have to validate that in the research. And that's our goal, and that's what I work with Jenna on, is how can I make sure from a research frame that we're actually measuring and seeing the progress that we think we're seeing in the clinic? Good summary. Um, does anybody, Nick, do you have any questions for us before we finish this thing off? And for the listeners, just stay tuned because there's more coming out every day and look for a provider near you who can treat dysautonomia and has done the latest research and is reading everything that's coming out because there is more coming out every day. Um, if you are a provider listening to this, check us at ACRM. 
or check in with us at CSM because we are presenting at both. And you can be any type of healthcare provider. You can be a, a PA, an NP, an MD, a PT, OT, speech. Anybody can really start to identify dysautonomia and test for it. Um, and then PT does kind of take over some of the exercise uh, prescription, but there are occupational therapists getting involved in this. There are other people getting involved in this world. So more hands on deck are welcome for sure. So, so where can people read, read, read these studies and or find out just more about them? Uh, Jenna, you do that one. <laughs> Um, so our first study, the one that we were talking about originally, which was the trends of the signs and symptoms, was published in Brain Impairment. It's a, a peer-reviewed journal based yeah. out of Australia. So it's available online. Um, so Nick, I, I don't know if you have like where we can give you a link to post to it if you... Um, yeah, I have I have links here. I have links to the... the you send me the abstract link. Yep. And then yeah. um, our, our study that just got approved um, this morning... Um, I guess, can I say it, Lauren, right? I don't know. Let's, uh, Let's hold off, maybe. I will, I will. Hold off, but we'll we'll share that link once it's published and um, and ready to go. But that we're hoping um, should come out in the next couple of months. Um, and then our uh, the presentation everybody's been talking about, the one that we're doing at ACRM, is uh, November 9th, I believe, in Chicago. Um, so we will be there um, to present that research. And then again, at the end of February in San Diego at CSM. Yeah, and CSM is the American Physical Therapist Association. The, yes. Right. Combined sections meeting. Mm -hmm. It's uh, our big annual conference for the year. Cool. All right. Well, I think I don't think I have any more questions really about the. Uh, the yeah, okay. Well, I said different. The, the 12 the twelve first study versus the 57. What's the difference in time? And like when you say you, say you want to do it, see if they, you know, again, they were joking around, but I said that they could come back and, and see where they are. But is there like, would there have been, would they have been away from anything for, from study for like five years and then come back and do it? Is there no difference in when they did it? That would be interesting to do like a five year long term. Five follow up these people were just still in treatment so oh. they were 37 days so they they had been in treatment for a, a little over a month yeah and we really tested them so they were still in concurrent treatment versus the other people um the other 45 didn't need a repeat test and so we didn't do oh. a repeat test um there wasn't currently there's not any guidelines in the literature to say you have to do a repeat test but and how because long ago, how long ago was that though uh, sorry how long ago was that that yeah. was 29 years ago it's two years ago, I think. Yeah, it was right after COVID started. And the trial people was a bit less than two years or two years, same thing? I think a little less than two years. Yeah, you, you can start to see how long it takes to get things uh, in print, right? No, again, yeah, <laughs> so I just wondering if there's a difference in like, say, okay, they have more time to recover or less time to recover. But I mean, that's more just general science probably. Yeah, and that, that's a good question too. Like, did the people who ended up in the twelve people take a little bit longer? You know, the general the general outcomes of the study they were about the same amount of time. They were around a oh. month post injury when they came in, but we don't have enough robust data to separate them into two groups. So, what be really interesting is, did the people who needed a retest were they did they come to me a little bit later? Now, the current data that we have published doesn't look like it. But it, once you start actually running an analysis on it, it could be that they were significantly different. But to do that, the, the, the data is not robust enough to warrant that type of nitpicking. But it would be very interesting to do in a prospective study with a lot more patients to yeah. look at, is there a difference from how far out of injury you are? Um, and I definitely want to do that. That's a, that's a big thing that I want to look at. But I don't want to dig into data that isn't significant enough to and then sit and say we have this hard and fast answer um yeah. that might be a little bit skewed yeah i definitely think we can we're going to incorporate that into some future studies but yeah i don't think at this point uh, we can really pull that information effectively mm -hmm. yeah and you could pull any information you want but it's just whether yeah. or not you're misleading people right. it's just, <laughs> whether or not it, it's significant and it really um yeah matters <laughs> Well, everyone, thanks so much for listening. Jenna, do you have any final thoughts before we uh, sign off here? Uh, no, but I would just like to thank both of you for having me today and thank you all for listening. Um, it's been great to, to chat about something that I feel like has become 
I mean, it's really important to, to get out there and for people to understand about. And if you are, um, you know, seeking treatment for this and you can't find somebody near you, you know, reach out. Um, there's always somebody who, you know, maybe we could help you find or, you know, refer you to, um, and just kind of help spread the word. Um, so that way more people understand and will seek more information on this topic. And then another great uh, ref reference point for you if you do have dysautonomia or think you have dysautonomia is dysautonomiainternational.org is the best organization that's out there. They have been out there for a long time. People are finally listening to them. Um, they have got grants. They've got all kinds of resources available. So if you go to dysautonomiainternational.org, you can find all kinds of information um, about dysautonomia and the subcategories. Um, you can go to our previous podcasts on dysautonomia or on POTS that we've done with Nick in the past. You can We're just on filter PD. for on 3 Phoenix. PD. On 3PD. And 3PD. You can go and look <laughs> at that one. You can, you can listen to them all. If you were just like, oh my gosh, Maybe I just love did. listening to Lauren. You could list, listen to me yammer on about all kinds of things. Um, and then if you have any topics you want us to talk about, please send them into Nick um, because I need things to talk about. So I feel like you've all listened to me about everything. So I don't, I don't know. But if you got anything um, from your aspect of recovery that you want us to touch on, we'd be happy to do that topic. So just send them over to Nick. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks everyone for being here. And I'm excited to be back. Oh, thank you both. And uh, I will now turn off recording. So bye-bye YouTube. <laughs>